Good evening, everybody, and good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Dr. Steingo is here with us this evening, and we're here to speak about the, um, the basics of MS now as opposed to 20 years ago. And so what we would like to know is what your opinion is on how far we have advanced with medications and treatments as a whole for whether it be the actual disease or for the symptoms. Actually, you said the past 20 years, which is interesting because if you recall, which you might not, MS was actually first described about 150 years ago. So Charcot actually described MS about 150 years ago, approximately, I think it was about 1868, 150 years, let's say. And if you think about that, that means until 20 years ago, for that whole huge period of time, we had nothing. And now, in the last 20 years, we have an immense amount of activity with MS. So, to, so the development of MS in the last 20 years has been nothing short of amazing, that from going from nothing in the first 130 years that we knew about this disease, to now having at least a dozen drugs approved and ongoing exciting research uh, is actually an amazing uh, period of time to live and be dealing with MS. So 20 years ago, like what were the first medications that came about? Well, the first medications, so the medications we're talking about are the medications to actually treat the disease of MS. We have had other medications around to maybe help some of the symptoms, but we're talking about the drugs used to treat the symptom, the disease, and we call those disease-modifying therapies or disease-modifying drugs. And the first one was approved in 1993. That was beta-seron. Beta interferon 1B. That was the first one in 1993. In 1996, the next drugs were approved, which was Avonex and Copaxone, and later Rebif came along. So the first four approved medications were all injectable medications. Okay. And so where have we come since then? Well, the next drug approved after that was Tysabri, which is a, an active uh, infusion drug, uh, which uh, came on the market and was briefly removed from the market because of some complications uh, that we've learned about. Uh, after Tysabri came three oral medications. Uh, the oldest of these is now five years old already. That's Jelenia. Jelenia is already five years old. And then we got Abagio and Tecfidera. So we now have three oral medications. And then most recently in the past year, we have another infusion drug called Lemtrada. In addition, we have other forms of Copaxone. We have Copaxone, which moved from a daily injection to three times a week. And most recently, the first uh, gener generic form of a medication, generic Copaxone. Okay. So... Where do you find that we're going in the future uh, for like second and third generation medications? Do you see that there'll be a decline at all to, to any one more than another? Well, there's still drugs in research and, and we anticipate the next year or two, there could be at least another two drugs approved. So we're still uh, you know, advancing with the medications and hopefully as we move forward, we'll get medications that are equally potent or equally beneficial but with better safety profiles. So now what we have is we have medications with, with very known and good benefits, but some safety concerns. So going forward, hopefully we'll be able to find new medications that offer great benefits, but with less, less safety concerns. The medications that are out here right now are primarily for relapse and remitting multiple sclerosis, or also known as RRMS. What do you see coming in the near future or in the distant future for those with secondary progressive MS, SPMS, or primary progressive MS, PPMS? I think just to clarify one point in the future that we might think about MS in a different way as two types of MS instead of all these different types we've thought about over the years. And we might think about it as a relapsing type of MS and a progressive type of MS. And you're right, all the drugs that have been approved so far are for the relapsing forms of MS, except for one. And that's Novantron, which is a chemotherapy drug, which is the only drug approved in the US for so-called secondary progressive MS. Uh, most recently at the big European MS meeting in Barcelona, uh, there was a medication called ocreluzumab, uh, which seemed to have some positive results for primary progressive MS. So we're hopeful that the uh, FDA will uh, view this with compassion and say there is nothing available, and here's our first drug for progressive MS, a disease for which we have nothing, and we'll hopefully approve that in the near future. Great. What do you also see, getting away from the direct um, uh, MS therapies, as far as for when people are affected with all the symptoms that they're having, how far along are we now with with covering medications for like every symptom that there is? You know, there are so many symptoms. You know, MS is a disease that can affect any part of the brain, spinal cord, or optic nerve. So the symptoms of MS are very widespread. But we do have improvements in the symptoms. Uh, for example, in the past few years, we've got new medications to manage walking. We have a natural medication called delfampridine or Ampira to help with walking. Uh, some people with MS have abnormal moods, mood swings, labile mood. 
uh, emotional changes, inappropriate emotions. We have a medication for that called Nudexta. Uh, we're learning about new medications and new ways of managing bladder problems. Uh, we're more attentive to other problems. Because we have drugs to treat the disease, uh, we do much more for everything else. People attend and see their doctors more often, and so we can treat everything more often. Furthermore, in addition to treating the symptoms, we understand the importance of other things like exercise and diet. Excellent. Thank you for those responses. MRI. Let's talk about MRI for a minute. How has MRI advanced in the last 20 years? So MRI really, we should go back about 30 years because that's when MRI kind of became a clinical tool in the early 1980s. Uh, before that, it was, very, it was hard to diagnose MS. It was predominantly a clinical diagnosis because CAT scans are not useful for diagnosing MS. And the MRI is extremely useful. So MRIs, it was noted on MRIs that we could see the lesions of MS on the scans. And so scans have been a very important tool. In fact, in order to diagnose MS, we incorporate the MRI into our diagnostic uh, tools. It's very important. And so we look at the different features of MRIs. We look at MRIs with contrast and without contrast. We can look at MRIs of the brain. We can look at MRIs of the spinal cord. Uh, we can follow the MRIs over time. And so they give us a considerable amount of information about what's happening inside someone's brain and spinal cord. Uh, there are advancing MRI techniques, more powerful magnets, so-called 3T magnets or 7T magnets. And there are many other techniques, functional MRI and different kinds of MRIs that are showing much more detail and uh, going forward, we may be able to actually measure atrophy in the brain, for example, in the clinic. Right now, they can do it in trials, but we can do it in the clinic only by eyeing it. It's very, the software is not available for everyone to use. It's not that easy. So hopefully, going forward, we'll be able to do a lot of things that are going to help us more with the MRI. But it has been an incredibly useful method of uh, diagnosing and monitoring MS. Okay, so we use MRI to find relapse in many patients. And what now is happening with multiple sclerosis relapse. I mean, how do we treat this? Well, we don't always have to do an MRI for relapse, but sometimes, we, sometimes it will help us if we're uncertain. And the way MRI helps us with the relapse is that if there is a relapse in that situation, there would be a, a portion of the brain uh, which would be inflamed. And with the MRI, we give a person in such a situation, we give them a contrast called gadolinium, and the gadolinium causes that lesion in the brain to light up. That's how we know that it's active and therefore consistent with the relapse. And yes, we can, the treatment of relapses, uh, and most important thing about a relapse first is to determine that it is a relapse, uh, which means uh, that we need to differentiate it from a pseudo relapse. For example, if a person with MS has high fever, if they have an upper respiratory infection, a cough or a cold, or urinary tract infection commonly, and their temperature goes up, they feel weak, and all their symptoms could be exacerbated, their symptoms could be worse. And it's not really a relapse, it's simply that they're worse because they have high fever and they're sick. And so in that situation, we should treat their illness and not just give them a medication to treat their relapse if we're not certain what it is. So we always need to be certain that a relapse is a relapse and not a pseudo-relapse, uh, that there's nothing else that's caused it, that there's no infection, uh, that there's no change in their medications or stress or something else that caused them to feel out of sorts. And then the medications, we do have medications for relapses. Uh, the first choice medication is solumedrol. That's the standard because it's much easier to administer. If solumedrol fails, uh, we are also able to use something called Acthar. Uh, Acthar is uh, actually ACTH gel. ACTH is derived from the pituitary gland. And actually, ACTH was the first drug approved for MS. But initial administration of it was very difficult over several weeks, so solumedrol became the first line treatment. But if it does fail or someone can't tolerate it, then we could go to Acthar as well. How long do you... How long is the determination to know if solumedrol does not work before you can put somebody onto ACTH? Well, what solumedrol does is reduce inflammation. So you have an inflamed area, and the solumedrol will reduce the inflammation, but if there is some underlying brain tissue that's not functioning, it's got to take time to recover. So uh, the purpose of solumedrol is to stop the inflammation, and someone may take two to four weeks to recover. So I wouldn't, so typically after giving solumedrol, I would wait two to four weeks to see if there's recovery, unless they're progressing. If they are progressing, that means the solumedrol hasn't controlled the inflammation, then we have to consider whether we have to do some other options. Great. Thank you for that reply. We've heard from a lot of patients, and we know that uh, patients do need to know that, or, and also their caregivers, that just because you're having a relapse, it doesn't mean that it's going to be discoverable with MRI, or that MRI may not even show that they're having an MS relapse. How else do you determine if they're having an MS relapse? So the MRI and the way someone feels don't always correlate. 
They do sometimes, but often they don't. You can see someone with an MRI that is loaded with disease and they don't look that bad. The classical, but you look so good, MS patient. And you can see the opposite. Someone that is having difficulty walking, but their MRI scan doesn't have many lesions. So sometimes it depends where the lesion is. If it's in a critical area, just a small lesion can cause severe damage, whereas someone with more extensive lesions, if they're not in that critical areas, may not be as damaged. We don't do MRI scans for every relapse. Uh, if it's a patient who's well known to us, a person that we know is reliable and reports the symptoms and their new symptoms, this is key for relapse. It has to be either something that's new or something you had before that got worse and lasted at least 24 hours. And as I said before, there should be no other cause for it. So we need all those things to be in place. And if all those things are in place, then we can make a decision about where we want to treat them. We, may, we might not always do a scan. Um, and then we make it so the decision might be made clinically. If it's someone who's well known to us and we know their record very well, we know their symptoms very well, we might sometimes treat them without seeing them and saying, having a relapse has other implications other than treating the relapse. Because the other implication, the big implication is, is your disease modifying drug working for you? The fact that you're having a relapse means your drug might not be working. So what we could do now, is either we're going to see you today and decide on treatment, or we're going to treat you because we know you well and you're a reliable historian, you're, you give us good history, you communicate well, and then we will see you and make an appointment to discuss further treatment. Great. Thank you for your reply. Vitamin D. The world has been hearing about vitamin D, not just for multiple sclerosis, but for general life, it seems, right now. So what can you tell us about vitamin D? Well, I, I mean, you're right. You're reading about it all over the press for everything, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and all kinds of things. But for MS, it's clearly been shown to be a very important substance. And some people consider it to be even more than a vitamin. Maybe it's got hormonal actions even. So uh, this goes back way back to the theory of MS that we know for years in the past that people who were born in northern latitudes uh, had more MS than people who were born down south. And some theories came about that if you live up north, you have less sun. And so if you have less sun, you have less vitamin D, and that was a cause for MS. And over time now, it's been borne out that people have low vitamin D, and that low vitamin D is a risk factor for development of MS, and even in some studies that are related to progression of MS. So vitamin D is very important uh, in MS. So for the patients that want to know how they get tested for vitamin D, or they, they can't just think that they should take a certain amount of um, units per day of vitamin D, how do they know what they should be taking? Well, we can do a blood test. It's very easy to do that. So we just do a straightforward blood test and we look for, and we measure it and see what the level is. Uh, as long as we can keep an eye on the level, see, uh, then we can tell them what to do. We aim, the level we're aiming for, most people, most of the experts are saying, you need a level of about 75 in the blood. Uh, there are on the cells in our body, on many cells, not only the, not only the brain, and many cells in our body have vitamin D receptors. And so the vitamin D attaches to these receptors on the cell surface. And the theory in, from the experts is that you need a level of about 75 to saturate so that the vitamin D fills all these receptors and then you get the required response. Great. Thank you for that reply too. Last one that I'm going to ask you today is about nutrition. What are the beneficial diets to be on these days? Uh, so this is a Controversial question in some way. Some people think diet is very important. Other people think it's less important. Furthermore, if you go on the internet and look up MS diet, you're going to find 25 different diets published by different kind of people. There's the gluten-free diet. There's the Dr. Walls, Terry Walls diet. There's the Swank diet. There's the Sunshine diet. There's the Gold Coast diet. I mean, there's many different diets that are out there. I don't think there's a consensus of opinion. Um, I would recommend to people to go to MS Views and News uh, and uh, look back in the archives of YouTubes and go back to the uh, meeting that was held recently at the Renaissance Hotel in November and uh, I spoke there about nutrition and there's uh, more information over there. I think if you go back to the original Swank diet, Dr. Swank talked about the importance of uh, eating unsaturated fats and I'm going to stress that that's my belief is that uh, saturated fats are in fact uh, bad for MS uh, and that people should concentrate on eating polyunsaturated fats which are fats that you can obtain from fish sources or fats that you can obtain from plants like walnuts and canola oil and things of that nature. There actually has been a study published recently in the journal Immunity uh, where in animal models of MS, they found that so-called short chain fatty acids uh, actually promoted the health of the immune system in the gastrointestinal tract 
and long-chain fatty acids cause bad outcomes. So we know that the diet has some effect. Uh, the gastrointestinal tract, going from your, your stomach, your intestines, the colon, that whole area is, is uh, the, the gastrointestinal tract, we have a microbiome. It means a small living environment. There are billions or trillions of bacteria living there, and more and more we're thinking they play an important role uh, in MS, because a huge part of your immune system resides in the gastrointestinal tract. And so what you put into it, I think, is very important. And different people have different ideas of what you can and can't put into it. Uh, but I think it's important to look at your diet. And, and what I say, and I'm now saying this ahead of time, disclaimer, this is my opinion. This doesn't mean it's the truth, but I, I think it is. But it is the following things. Avoid saturated fats. And most saturated fat sources are animals, animal fat. So no red meat, for example, no dairy. It's my diet. Okay, avoid saturated fats. Avoid salt. We know more and more that salt is important. Don't cook with salt, don't add salt. Avoid sugar. We know that sugar is a toxin. And so avoid sugar. Don't drink all these colas, all these sodas with sugar are poisonous. Uh, if you want to add something sweetener to your coffee or tea, which you certainly may need, add stevia. That is a good sweetener. I think artificial sweeteners of the type that we have, the blue ones, the yellow ones, the pink ones, uh, do and are, are not great because they do, in fact, affect this microbiome, which is the gastrointestinal tract. So uh, it's, the, it's the S topics. It's no, no, no saturated fats, no salt, no sugar, no smoking. But yes to stevia. But yes to stevia. <laughs> yes. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, you're welcome. You were an excellent interviewee. Maybe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.